So today in this video, we're at the Pueblo Grande Archaeological Park. Aaron and I have never been here before, so we don't know what we're going to see, but come along and let's find out. So this facility includes a two-third of a mile outdoor interpretive trail exploring an 800-year-old Hohokam platform mound, a ball court, native plant garden, and replicated homes. Pueblo Grande has been a National Historic Landmark since 1964. Come on in. Uh, so the suggestion is, is to go do the outdoor part first because it's going to get hot and then we can go and look at the museum when we're done. Here today is a modern irrigation canal. This is actually not new to the Phoenix area, that the original people that lived here also irrigated a large amount of this valley and grew crops. So the O'odham tradition suggests that canal irrigation was first practiced by the people that lived here at Pueblo Grande. So what you see in front of us is the platform mound or Vahakai, meaning ceremonial house in the O'odham language. Pueblo Grande is one of the largest Vahakai ever created. After it was destroyed, the platform mound became an important O'odham shrine, which continues to be sac a sacred place for affiliated tribal communities. The first archaeological excavations of the platform mound took place in May and June of 1901. A medical doctor, Dr. Joshua Miller, led the investigation. It says here, Miller learned the hard way that the platform is a solid construction. Earlier rooms and architecture were collapsed and incorporated into the mound as it ex expanded and grew taller. A chamber and fill method was used to create walls interior cells that hold a mixture of earth and debris to construct the platform. So I think he, he was operating under the premise that it was, this structure was more like a, like a Pueblo that people lived in. And so it would have rooms that would be empty that you could excavate and, and then you'd see evidence of inhabitants, but that's not really what this structure ever was. It was, it was a platform. It sounds like he excavated into it, hoping to find these interior rooms, but they didn't exist. Yes. And I think he must have been puzzled by how they were filled and what was happening and, you know, the evidence he was finding. So they had a platform that they used this, like, sell and fill method to create the platform, but they did have rooms on top. Evidence suggests that the current mound began as two smaller mounds around AD 1100, and then by 1300 they had merged into one large mound, which was enclosed by a large adobe wall. So this whole thing is the mound that we're standing on? Yes. The whole thing is the mound. I never knew any kind of structures like this existed. I think I assumed that um, ceremonial activities took place only in structures like a kiva. I didn't know that they were, that indigenous people in this area were building like a platform structure type thing as well. I don't think it's uncommon though. I haven't been there, but 
in the Midwest near St. Louis, there were a mound builder culture. Yes. And the top of those mounds are probably used for ceremonial activities. Yes. Sacred I mean, activities. I mean, you could see, you know, the Mayans built pyramids so that they could be and the up Aztecs. higher. So you could see why you would do that. These rooms on the outside here were constructed between 1300 and 1450. They're not residences, but are areas for ceremonial and craft activities like weaving and bas basketry, processing of paints for pottery, pottery decoration, shell jewelry production, and the preparation and storage of sacred objects. There's cooking pits, caches of obsidian nodules, shell and stone beads, piles of stone axes, quartz crystals and minerals, and a variety of locally made and imported pottery. You know, it's kind of amazing that this archaeological site exists right in the middle of Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, you there's... Know, just surrounded by industrial and... There's airplanes freeway. flying over and freeways. Yeah. Ugh. One thing about a site like this is it looks like a lot of it could still be excavated. But the thing about archaeological excavation is when you excavate a site, you destroy the site. Yeah. So it'll yeah. no longer exist once the excavation is complete. And you can, you can, I think people think that it's worth it because you can preserve some of the artifacts in like a museum setting, for example. But the actual features themselves will be gone. Once you know enough about a culture, at that point, continuing to excavate sites by that culture, of that culture, it's just destruction. Yeah. You're not really learning anything and you're, you're hoping to find artifacts or something like that. Today in modern archaeology, excavation is avoided. Excavation is really on, only used as a tool to gather data in, in situations where there's a building project that is going to take place and you're trying to save that information before it's destroyed. Yeah. Right. I would like to think that the days of, of excavation just for the sake of excavation are behind us. Yeah, I think so. So this information panel asks the question, why would the Hohokam settle in the hot, dry desert? But they point out that when the Hohokam settled here, the Salt River ran year-round, and it fed smaller canals all over the desert. So what you see here is supposed to approximate a Hohokam adobe home that would have been built sometime between 1,150 to 1,450 A.D. I guess the big difference between the replica and what they speculate the ancient home would have looked like is that the doors and ceilings would have been a little bit lower. All right, so behind me here are replicas of Hohokam pit houses. The replicas are meant to mimic pit houses that would have existed around 950 AD. Now I expected the floor to be lower. Yeah, I think they've 
taken some liberties with the replica homes. Yeah, it's not much of a pit house. No. They used games as a way to bring people together for ceremonies and like trading markets and like settling civil disputes. Right, so what we have here that you can see is what they call the ball court. This is their heritage garden. I guess this uh, fencing here is a windbreak for the traditional kitchen. Okay. So they could have their cook fire there and cook food with this sort of specialized wall of branches. So here are different plants they would grow, squash. beans and corn or maize some type of gourd a melon Something they call devil's claw. Sunflowers. It's really, that's an incredible network of canals. Yeah. But it's all depending on that Salt River being full. Yeah, so here's Phoenix. And then that just shows you the scale. All the way over to Tempe here. Mesa. Here's a model of Pueblo Grande and the platform mound. So when Miller was excavating it, he just assumed that this, the blocky area around that is the mound was a Pueblo. And so was confused about why he wasn't finding what he assumed he would find. Right, interior spaces, not realizing that it built up over time and they would fill and build. And it was all to have this raised platform where they could do these different ceremonial activities. So what you see here is different stone tools, basically stone axes or choppers. Look how fine those projectile points are. The groove stone there is for straightening and smoothing arrow shafts. That turtle effigy is really sweet. And there's another scoop with a figure on it. So here's a, another example of a matate and a mono. The mono is the smaller stone on top that you would slide back and forth across the matate to grind maize or whatever it is that you're working. To make meal or flour or a paste. Here's something similar, but slightly different. You have a mortar and pestle. This one's showing grinding mesquite pods to make a, a mesquite flour. I love this jar with the figures holding hands. 
And it's saying this one, this bull, black on red, is probably from eastern Arizona. These small pitchers. Possibly dog effigies. Depiction of canids are common in Hohokam ho art. There's a woven mat fragment. They're using lots of shells and different sorts of turquoise and beads. Yeah, there's the turquoise. So what you see here are spindle whorls. It's a replica of a backstrap loom. And those are textile replicas. Because they were growing cotton around here. That was our video on the Pueblo Grande Archaeological Park. I hope you learned a few things. I think we did. I recommend coming early. Like other places around Phoenix, there's no shade, so it gets really hot. Please support this channel by commenting on this video, hitting that like button, and most importantly, please subscribe to Searching for History. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.